Greetings everyone. I welcome you very much to the Beeching Wood Archery Collection and um, hopefully you will have the inspiration you know, to take up archery yourselves sometime in the future. I started uh, my archery career some six decades ago and uh, many of the items which I initially shot with are within the collection. My longbow, my first recurve bow, it was a Jack Yeoman bow, and um, also my recurve bow. I'd like to take you into the museum to have a look round of all the artefacts there. I think you will be surprised at what I've managed to collect over a number of years. I owe it to several people whom I've known in the past who have made generous donations to the collection, and uh, they're there for posterity, and hopefully the establishment of a charitable trust will come into being sometime in the very near future whereby it will be enabled to be conserved and uh, my efforts are directed to that effort to make it into a charitable, into a charitable trust and uh, while the Charity Commission are sympathetic their demands are not easy and uh, it will take some time of negotiation to bring it actually into being. As you approach the front door, uh, you then go into the main lobby and the ground floor corridor where there are many prints on show. And uh, the reason why I had a construction of an annex to a ground floor annex to the main gallery was for the display of the many photographs, prints, watercolours and even oils that hang on the wall. There are, uh, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are somewhere in the region of between three and four hundred which have been displayed. There are no windows within the actual gallery itself, picture gallery. They are uh, given light by roof lights the main importance there being the creation of wall space for the pictures on which to hang. I think you will appreciate what you're going to see. We now go forward. This was the recurve bow, which was manufactured by uh, uh, Les, uh, Leslie Harris, Les Harris of Marksman Bows. That's his uh, premier bow which is a TS4, Olympic TS4, which uh, managed the archers to shoot over a thousand, a thousand York. And uh, it was um, a bow that was considered to be uh, one of his finest bows that came out from his uh, workshops, the Olympic TS4. A, beautiful, a, a very beautiful bow made by craftsmen. Uh, these, these bows were manufactured by Russ Wilcox. He appears as a, in a photograph which is in the edition uh, of American Archery as written by Dr. Robert Elmer in 1951, the year in which it was published. And within its pages there is a photograph of Russ Wilcox standing near his workshop with his Dalmatian dog. And uh, it always stands very much in my mind when I wish to reflect upon Russ Wilcox. He produced some uh, very, very wonderful bows and uh, they were the first Rika bows which really came out from America in the early 1950s. Several aspiring UK archers wanted to buy Russ Wilcox bows and one particular person, uh, archer in Hastings, um, managed to acquire two or three bows by the uh, goodwill of the United States Air Force. In other words, the pilots who were travelling across the pond brought back some, bow, some of Russ Wilcox's bows. 
and uh, that's how they arrived back in the United in the United Kingdom. Their bows, which are to be treasured, they're historical bows because they are the, one of the first re, really Rico bows which were manufactured for the archery world. And they were followed in by other uh, designers and manufacturers subsequently. All the containers here for the holding of arrows, arrow quivers, are from Cornish tin. And uh, they were made by various manufacturers, really in small workshops, for uh, fletchers of that period in the, in the 19th century. And as a consequence, you will see all shapes and sizes and all various colours, but most of them were in light green, rather like this. I mean, that is, that is for holding uh, 28 to 30 inch arrows. So you can see the workmanship in it. Now, a lot, so many, hundreds of the uh, tin quivers have been um, scrapped. And, uh, you know, you don't see many come onto the market. Not now. And as a consequence, that most of these were followed in by boxes here, which were made by the Fleshers, and particularly by um, Eldred. And... Uh, they are excellently made. Those boxes here were manufactured or made by um, Russell French. You can see the quality of workmanship in there. He was a very fine workman, was Russell French, not only in the manufacture of bows, long bows, uh, but also in any work, in woodwork, which he managed to accomplish. He was a perfectionist and his bows were noted for their quality and uh, he would spend, could be, three weeks or a month in, in, their, in their construction and as a consequence it was very tiring work for him but he used to manufacture, I should think possibly, maybe four or five bows a year for, uh, for friends and for leading uh, archers in the country during the, the 1990s. The Beechingwood Collection holds the greatest number of bow boxes and uh, they're of all shapes and sizes and at one time they were made by village uh, carpenters uh, but uh, Aldred was noted for the quality of the uh, um, Ascombs which were familiar and known as coffins because they're so large. And there is one particular coffin, which I'd like to show you a bow box, which has been designed by a Scottish bowyer as a coffin in its own right, a small one. You can see it, they used to write the name on them. And uh, that one is R-D-C-O-N. I don't know quite sure what that's the initial stand for, the surname, but... Um, they could be recognised readily because invariably they used to go in, on, in goods compartment to be travelled. Lots of archers travelled by the Victorian trains to go down possibly to Exeter or Weymouth, etc., um, you know, to shoot at, at uh, the Grand Western Archery Society's shoots and also into the Midlands, particularly to Leamington Spa and other locations in Middle England. So it was uh, an interest to try to conserve as many as possible. I mean, some of these boxes are quite uh, um, subtly and artistically made. And there is one here, if you can see, in the workmanship in this particular quiver. So that is uh, a, a wonderful piece of work where two arrows have been crossed with the work to, to these to the box and you can see the quality of the arrows therein not only with the piles but also with the knocks the horn knocks with steel tip tips tapered tips 
Now, that, that is a particular interest to me as a collector because it demonstrates the uh, tin quivers, leather quivers were in being, but they are very, very rare. They are very heavy duty leather and it can only be made by a good craftsman. And they're very heavy and uh, some have caps, some of them are just open at the top. But there are one or two, and this one here is an ex exact example of, of which the tin ones were then uh, made. And this is an example here. That's leather in its entirety. It would be, it could be between 1750 and uh, 1800. This cabinet holds some Hereford arrows. The Hereford meeting uh, is still held uh, and they do meet three or four times a year. And there's various sizes of Hereford arrows which are there within, the, within this cabinet. It was conventional that archers shooting at uh, what I would call um, spa towns to say at principal hotels. And the hotels tried as hosts to meet the demands of their customers. And as a consequence, if golfers were coming along, they would have toast racks of uh, golf clubs. If artists come along, they had toast racks of, um, to meet the requirements of um, archers, for instance, a small target, and they would be handled at the top. There would be the bows at the bottom, and even quivers at each end to hold the uh, uh, the frame of the toast rack. And there's an example there of two. Uh, I would have thought they were either from Leamington Spa or from. Uh, Western Supermare or, or somewhere of that location down in the West Country. Exmouth was a, a stronghold for archery and when we go into the extension I shall be very pleased to show you some bows which have come through from the Pierre Motley family which have recently joined the collection. They're very fine bows and one bow is said to be shot by the Reverend John Perry King, or Charles John Perry King, who was six times West Country champion. I'm very pleased that they have been able to join the collection. We go forward a little bit. While speaking about the awards which were presented to the Royal Kentish Bowmen and to the Royal British Bowmen, the two which are on display in the cabinet here, these bugles were presented between 1792 and uh, the end of 1800. And unfortunately, like so many of the societies, they were closed simply by the Napoleonic Wars. A lot of the archers shooting at the Royal British Bowmen and the Royal Kentish Bowmen were killed and most were commissions which were bought by their fathers. This is of a, a particular interest here, and it's a, although it's contemporary, it's a rare. Now that demonstrates a CFAD bow, a steel bow, which is in first class condition, with uh, contemporary bows there which were manufactured um, by the Swedes in alloy. So they preceded those which were manufactured in England by Eccles and Pollock and further by the uh, production which came through in from America. And uh, they had steel strings but then they went over to the linen strings um, which are on display here now. I mean, that's a lovely, lovely set. I haven't seen another set of CFAB equipment 
in all my further career in archery. These bows here represent Eccles and Pollock bows. They had two series. One was a tournament and one was a club series. And uh, as you can see with the variation in colours, it indicated whether they were for ladies or for juniors or whether they were for uh, heavier poundages, which sometimes were used by, by men. But the lighter, the shorter the bows, which are on the extension there to the left, um, the swallow and the swift, um, were um, shot by ladies or smaller gentlemen. The martin bow is the cheaper version of the falcon bow. The falcon bow was the bow used by top archers shooting between 1949, 1948, round through to about 1952-54. And the one who excelled and broke the record, which is a Guinness recorded record, was by Jack Collier. Jack Collier shot with a basic steel bow in a York round, one way, shooting 913. He was a very modest man, uh, humble, but of a nice disposition. And uh, he was congratulated by the archery fraternity for his dedication in, in his uh, shooting career. He was about 26 when he achieved that and outshot uh, the leading archers in this country. He had his forearm right behind the arrow and there was no exaggeration in his loose. He would just loose comfortably with his fingers and relax to the side of his face. He was a perfectionist and a man whom I greatly admired. And you'll be very pleased to see, if I may say so, Martin, the steel bow here, which is the falcon bow. It was a dark green and the light green one was just shorter. That's a kestrel. And the cream ones were the Merlin. The Merlin was shot by shorter, shorter gentlemen and also by ladies. Uh, to the right here, there is a, um, a engraving of the Prince of, uh, the Prince of Wales when he was a patron of the Royal Kentish Bowman which is just to your right hand side there. There he is, up at the top there. And uh, you can see that there is a quiver, a, uh, a quiver of wood. And I'm more than pleased to say that there is a replica of that particular one, which is just there, just on the side. That's a, a typical example of a quiver of the Georgian period which is quite a remarkable, shall we say, example. The type of quiver which was used, now he would be shooting with a bow which was typical of that era, which is a laminated bow. It's not a U-bow as such. Um, these are bows here, which are uh, by CFAB. Uh, they are very, they're, they're, they're more contemporary. They were manufactured uh, after the Second World War and uh, they're either Diana and they're a centaur, as the case may be, which are the principal ones which are manufactured by CFAB. The bows to the right hand side on the side there are really collectible items because they were manufactured between 1936 and 1940. They were the original CFAB bows. We then go on to arrow making and the arrows which were first manufactured alloy arrows were by um, Ackles and Pollock and they complemented the steel bows and uh, Jack when he was shooting would have been shooting with those type of quality arrows but they weren't, they were weighted, but they weren't spined. So therefore, 
uh, it's their alloy. But they did introduce a steel arrow. And the blues are steel arrows. Well, these are alloy arrows. But the alloy arrows were then perfected by Easton. They specialised in the manufacture of, of um, tubular items. Now, you, in actual fact, um, Martin, are interested in metals. And there is a coat of many colours, <laughs> in biblical terms. There are lots of uh, badges there, which I've used on that old archery blazer to be displayed. They may well be duplicated in other cabinets, which I will show you later. There are many interesting items here in the way of etchings. And there is one particular one which is just below uh, the Prince Regent. And that is at Worcester College. And Worcester College was where the Grand National Archery Society had their meetings um, before the Second World War and also up until about 1970 when it moved away to another venue. But you can see it quite clearly, the target boss there. This here is a very rare oil. It's an original oil of Alice, the eldest daughter of William Pell Frith. And William Pell Frith was an artist of renown who was most anxious to record sporting meetings and particularly uh, race courses and the attendance at racing meetings. He was also, because of his interest in, in uh, uh, archery by his daughters, he printed his three daughters actually shooting together, but he actually painted Alice uh, as, a, as, a, as his eldest daughter, um, who is very striking and beautiful, uh, you know, in the first instance, and followed by uh, his further two daughters, Fanny and Louise. And I should be very pleased to show you the um, print. The original is in Exeter Museum where he uh, lived down in the West Country. These are junior bows. Uh, and you may note that some do not have horns on them. And uh, they were designed for juniors while uh, Mummy was shooting. No doubt, possibly a little bow like that, which is a dear little creature, all right, would have been shot by her daughter or son. In, in company with mother. As you possibly appreciate that ladies were the principal archers in the Victorian era. It was considered very genteel, health-giving for ladies to shoot archery. Not only for exercise, but to try to beat uh, TB, tuberculosis, which was quite rampant within the population, particularly amongst, amongst ladies. The children were sent to uh, Switzerland, you know, to uh, uh, for restoration for um, tuberculosis and uh, on recovery. They were encouraged to take up archery simply because of the exercise of breathing in in shooting. These these are flat bows. What actually happened is when the long bow. Uh, proved to be inefficient uh, in, in, in their cast. The Americans introduced flat bows, either of laminated woods, Osage orange and possibly yew, possibly of lemon wood, which were very fast. And they further introduced recurve uh, bows, which the woods were steamed into position to give more resilience in the working of the limbs. But the bows which are on display here at the moment would be American and English bows. You may like to take a, a shot of those bows here. The quiver here on display was uh, 
at the same age as the leather quivers recorded earlier. I should think the date of that one would have been somewhere in the region of about 1720. It's made of tin, but uh, it's very, very unusual in its shape because it's desectioned. That would have been possibly for just three or four arrows. These pig caps on the side here, all right, are of interest. And I know you'll be particularly interested in taking that one there because that one has the logo of the Portsdown Archery Club, PAC. The Portsdown Archery Club was formed in about just after the, after the Second World War and was one of the leading archery clubs in the United Kingdom and produced some of the very finest archers with very noted people who were shooting. And at least three uh, archers from Portsdown managed to achieve a national status. Some very fine bows were produced by John Jakes of, of Thornton Heath in London. They produced some of the very first um, laminated bows. Some are here on show at the moment. So the flat bows came after the long bow and then the, the flat bows then had to give way to the steel bow. And eventually the steel bows by 1956 were being um, uh, shown the door by the arrival of the American laminated uh, fiberglass bows. The fiberglass bows uh, being um, a product of the Second World War when fiberglass was uh, used in the manufacture of aircraft. The first manufacturer of laminated bows were the Yeoman Bow, which was made by the British champion um, Frank Bilson. Mrs. Uh, uh, David Shepherd presented the uniforms of her late husband to the collection, which are, uh, uh, which are on show within the entrance hall. A very industrious man was David, and very much respected within the archery world during the 1960s and 70s. He was treasurer for FETA too, as was another august gentleman, and uh, that was John, John Kemper Smith. A very, very fine, he was a gentleman and dedicated to archery, not only as a coach, but also as a county, national and international judge. The bows uh, which are in, in the rack on the western side of, of the uh, collection, which follow down from the flat bows, um, reflect the ladies' long bows that were in use during the uh, Georgian period to the uh, Victorian era and furthermore into the Edwardian period and up until 1939. Now they are in very remarkable good condition and ladies obviously were not shooting heavy poundage bows and therefore the tendency was that their lifespan was enabled, because they weren't regularly shot, to be uh, in good condition. This section of the display area indicates the arm guards, in other words the braces if we're wearing on arms, and also string holders, whether they be taps, whether they be glass, whether they be, whether they be guns, or alternatively they would be of um, fingertips, which would be like this. These are what they call grease pots, and it was quite common archers were using finger stalls, which are on here, to occasionally dip them in to these little grease pots which had a type of lanolin within them, so as to keep them soft and subtle, which helped them 
you'll know to shoot more accurately. Otherwise, the, fingers, the fingertips would become set and hard, which leather goes eventually into that order. And uh, eventually, uh, from craftsmanship, which these are made by possibly um, a leather worker who made saddles, etc., saddlers, uh, eventually the manufacturers, say like Eldred, etc., and the larger manufacturers then developed a type of form of glove, which are here, which the ladies were able to slip straight on without having to worry about trying to fiddle and tighten onto their fingertips. And they proved very popular in the latter period of the Victorian era. The quality of leather work is of a very high standard and they would have been manufactured in towns rather like Yeovil and uh, I think Sherborne as well where there were uh, manufacturers of gloves. A lot of the art and crafts of uh, glove making um, unfortunately have been lost. But the grease pots are quite rare. The larger one would have been worn by some men but the smaller ones are not so. Uh, the lower ones here, at the lower, on the lower part of the cabinet, would have been worn by ladies. Particularly that bell-shaped one, which is to the left-hand side here. I have seen some actually carved in, in, uh, in made of ivory, but they've all got caps with uh, ivory at their tops. There's a little cushion here on the side, which you may like to mark. They used to shoot in practice and use pins to indicate where their arrows landed so they could mark them when they got home. So they would mark their arrows one, two, three and four, or five and six, seven, eight, nine or ten, because they would maybe shoot 12 arrows. And then they would select the six best arrows from the, from the number of arrows which they bought and then sort six which would be flying true as, as according to their um, pattern they made on that uh, little target. And some ladies were very slight in stature and as a consequence they wanted in leather work a small, a, a small uh, shall we say, cup in which to hold the arrows and this one which is typical they are very very rare but they were quite commonly used by ladies that little purse there would have been in a tackle box which was used by ladies to put shillings in and it was quite common for ladies to be shooting in a national round and a lady who shot a perfect end of three golds in at 50 or 60 yards was automatically complimented by competitors by, by donating a shilling. Now it is alleged that Alice Lee, who was lady champion, um, I think possibly 15 or 16 times, that she was able to live from her earnings on awards with prize money. Sometimes the prize money could have been 50 guineas. In some locations, it could have possibly been 100 guineas. So you can see the prestige which was given to some tournaments. But um, Alice, she was an exponent in, in archery and she managed to gain um, that status and recognition as a leading lady archer in the Victorian era. That, in actual fact, is a lovely watercolour, that one there, of the young man. And as you can see, the bow is not a D section, it's a round section. And uh, he is also holding a arrow which has a pile of horn. I'm unaware of his status or, or his name, 
that I'm delighted to say that it now hangs here within the Beach and Wood collection. This picture was not sold by uh, Bonhams in Glasgow, but I approached the auctioneers after uh, because it had to be restored, cleaned and restored, and uh, I arranged for it to be purchased uh, to come down south here to the collection, and I duly had it cleaned and also the gilt renewed. So it is in its glory as it was originally painted. There's a set of arrows here, which are rather remarkable. These arrows were found here in a roof space in Dorking. And they were passed to me by a dealer and the wording in there, if you can manage to get it through, these arrows were restored by Derek Rowe, a gentleman in his own right, but a wonderful craftsman. And he restored these arrows for me, for, this, for the collection. So they have long fleshings. They're fluted arrows. In other words, they are uh, grained with a plane right the way through. And the object of the exercise is to give strength to the arrow. And it just gives it that little extra degree of strength to the spine. And these arrows indicate it, particularly that one here. And that was by a special plane which was designed for them. And these are original horn piles. Note that they're also footed arrows too. They're a wonderful specimen of work by uh, Fletcher in the period uh, given over, you know, to tournament arrows in the uh, 18th and 19th, early 19th century. Tournament shooting really commenced in the 18th century and aristocracy were shooting regularly on their estates and also by uh, vicars and, and uh, members of the Church of, uh, of England. But they, they are superb arrows. I'm very pleased to say that Derek is still with us. He was a, a very good bowyer and uh, he has been noted for the quality of his workmanship. That is an excellent example again, unfletched arrow with the grooving to stiffen the arrow with, again, a horn knock. Note how it's been manufactured, designed with a very slender top. In other words, the weight as a bobtail arrow is forward all the time, which obviously fly straighter in windy conditions or inclement weather. Horn was regularly used in the um, Georgian period and during the early Victorian era. That uh, etching there indicates Lady Archer's shooting, but notice the dress and also recurve bows. Recurve bows were quite fashionable in the Edwardian period, it enabled the ladies to draw lighter bows of possibly anything below 20 pounds in draw weight. I mean, the average lady could shoot quite readily a 30 pound bow today, or up to 35 pounds. But the early Rico bows were designed solely to assist, shall we say, the gentility of ladies to enable them to, to practice archery with draw weights of say 16 pounds to reach 50 yards. Arrow cases were a speciality for some families and there's two there, two cases. This one was for M. E. Titchwell as the lower one would be one a carrying case for all the arrows and the accoutrements and represents workmanship of a very high standard. 
with strengthened corners. That would be the case of the 20th century. Is that one, the top one, merely by the locking mechanism is indicative that it would be uh, mid 19th century. The Beeching Wood Collection, as I've possibly already mentioned, has one of the finest collection of bow boxes and arrow boxes. Arm guards of various ages are here on show. These demonstrate for ladies and they have padding within them, as you can see quite clearly. Everything was considered for the ladies' comfort and with very fine strengthened centres but with fine leather work on the outside and padded inside. Some are virtually brand new and uh, are of an exceedingly high standard. Some even have velvet in them. Watercolours have been an, an item of uh, my keen collection and this, this particular one here was presented to the collection by Bob Brown. Bob Brown was a very active member of the Society of Arch Antiquaries and uh, he was a, an ardent collector of all types of bows, particularly Asiatic bows. That particular watercolour shows in detail the ground of the St. Leonard's arches. Now Princess Victoria would travel down to Hastings by a sing train and then take a, a, a horse-drawn coach to the ground at St. Leonard's and therefore it became the Royal St. Leonard's Archery Club and she spent many many happy days there and in the front of the watercolour are, are her colours on her flag which is flying there and she should, would be shooting quite regularly and as Princess Victoria and Queen Victoria she took an active interest in archery throughout her life. She was patron to the Royal Toxophilite Society and to the Royal British Bowman. Unfortunately, the Royal British Bowman was disbanded in about 1890. That was before her death. But she presented awards to the Royal British Bowman, one of which is to be recorded later in this programme. This reflects the watercolour next, next to the one which shows the ground of the Royal St. Leonard's ground is a tribute to shooting in the West Country. Now, the major events had really a regimental band to entertain the archers and they would regularly play at the intervals of the shooting which the ladies thoroughly enjoyed. They attracted many, many archers shooting, whether it was uh, gentlemen or ladies. And in many ways, uh, ladies were introduced to their future husbands at such meetings. But archer became a venue whereby uh, ladies could be introduced unofficially, you know, to um, associated gentlemen or would be young men to possibly be their suitor and uh, they were able possibly to, to select their husband rather than being introduced to them. That is a very rare print, an etching of Belbury Hall. Now Belbury Hall unfortunately was burnt down in the latter part of the 19th century and as far as I'm aware, that's the only print which is in existence which shows the original hall. The current owner wants to come down to see this uh, particular print to, you know, give an idea of how the hall originally looked. 
Most large houses encouraged archery shooting on lawns. Again here, there's boxes of, of, of arrow cases. Some are in beautiful condition. Some were deliberately manufactured to hold them in. And as you may see, the lids have been shaped. The MS has been shaped for a specific lady. That's a lady's case there with AF Windborne. They usually had either their initials on or their full name, but with initials, obviously, for their Christian names. The main reason is because a lot of archers, including ladies, have travelled away to shoot in the small towns, whether it's been Tunbridge Wells, Leamington Spa, Bath, as the case may be. And such places as spa towns had hotels in which people could take and enjoy uh, the shooting in comfortable accommodation. Those cannonballs here have been retrieved from the wreck of the Mary Rose and they were recovered pre-war, Second World War, by divers who brought them to the surface. And the first two are musket balls. The three are by uh, the uh, mid-deck cannons. And the lower one, as far as I can understand, was from the lower deck. The silver, which was presented by Queen Victoria, is in the middle of this display case. It was a, a very nice award in which to come through. That was presented in 1842 by Queen Victoria to the Royal British Bowman. That coat was worn, blazer was worn, by the gentleman over here on the right-hand side. This gentleman here, Bill Tucker. William Ernest Tucker. This is a tribute to William Bill Ernest Tucker, born September 1912 to April 2002, when he passed away. He was a judge, a coach, and a very, very competent uh, um, author and writer a very respected tournament organiser in the county of Essex. The coat and the medals were as his awards, as, as shown here on, on his coat, were passed by his daughter to this collection for safekeeping. This particular cabinet is very important because it contains the medals, the awards, of John, of the Reverend Charles John Perry Keane, Perry hyphenated Keane. You will see a photograph of him here wearing medals. The only one which is missing is the one in the middle. And they were presented by his great great nephew to the Beechingwood collection that um, he was. Uh, the champion of, of the West on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times and a Grand National Champion of the Grand National Archery Society and so won that in 1894. A society that has a long standing and goes back well back into the 19th century and they produce some very very fine awards as as at the back there they were all enameled with silver or gold and manufactured by uh, jewelers of the time again in this particular cabinet there's a grand selection of archery awards both contemporary and from the victorian era here is given over to the Royal Company of Archers and the main uniform which is on display 
It's Lieutenant Colonel Warrender of the Royal Company of Archers. As you can see, he was a slender gentleman of height and stature, and he carries the sword of honour as an officer. Uh, uniform coat, coats, jackets of a past era of the Royal Company because it goes back into the 17th century. Uh, that being one uh, senior um, one which would be early 19th century. Early 19th century that one would have been. On conditions that didn't allow shooting or possibly after a dinner, the Royal Company of Archers would play carpet bowls and there are an example of the carpet bowls which were used and they were played within Archers Hall in Edinburgh. So the balls are marked in, in various stages. So the balls are uh, RCA, Royal Company of Archers, which we covered any rain, or one in particular, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, the Queen's Bodyguard of Scotland. That's QB, QBGS. One of these bows, or some of these bows here, ladies' bows, were shot by Jean Lee's mother. As far as I'm aware, there is no bow from uh, Jean Lee herself. But there are bows which arrived from her parents. This particular, which, is, which was uh, made for our Blanche, which was being a lady's bow, which I don't know where omens, um, unfortunately for her, but it is it designed as a coffin. So that's why sometimes uh, bow boxes are said to be uh, bow coffins. Now the Woodman of Arden is one of the oldest of societies. There are three societies. One is the Royal Company in Scotland. The Woodman of Arden in Arden, near which is said, said to be central England, just south of Birmingham. And that one was the bow box of the Reverend W.C.R. Bedford. The Bedford family have been noted members of the Woodman of Arden for many decades. The quality of the ladies' longbows excels because they were the slimline design. Even the, uh, even the quality of the U was exceptional. And that is a slimline bow which was shot by lasers. No doubt originating either from Spain or from Italy. Is natural laminates. The sapwood would give at the back and the hardwood centre of the U would give the resilience, resistance to the draw between the two woods. The young wood and the senior wood would give a natural laminate to give the cast to the bow, the whippiness, the spring to the bow. That's a very fine example of a bow of the 19th century that would have been made by Eldred um, and uh, they produced some very quality bows as well as laminated bows. There would be approximately 200 ladies bows here on display. Some made of lemon wood throughout, uh, some laminated with lemon wood and a hardwood. Rosewood was often used 
Right, in Nathan's bows, the lemon wood on the back and the hardwood in the belly to give a resemblance of a yew bow. Sometimes they were as good as a yew bow because of their design and of the materials used. There are very good fleshers and I'm more than proud to open this case which was made by a Fletcher in Folkestone whom I'm pleased to say and proud that he is uh, a very active bowyer and Fletcher today and this was made for um, the Fletcher's company of which he was accepted as a Fletcher. It shows you his very fine workmanship in ivory, cresting and with fleshing the laminates which are employed through here which are quite remarkable. He's a very modest man and a very competent one. So there are three conical piles and three parallel piles, both of silver. The box he has made himself, all dovetailed, and the actual hinge is an old piano hinge, which is utilised to strengthen the lid. It's craftsmanship inlaid with the arrow um, divider and pinned down with a screw all of which have uh, inlaid with his uh, silver logo. Malcolm presented this to the collection and it equals a 19th century work which is now on display. These are again display arrows, superb workmanship and that indicates that these are prize arrows of of the Game, footed with ebony and inlaid with mother of pearl. The date would be approximately the latter part of the 19th century. It is given here as 1870. They're magnificent arrows. You can see the inlay to the knocks of ivory. They're peacock feathers. You can see the quality of the wood here and the finish. They're four footing arrow again inlaid towards the pile. They're marvellous specimens of that era. Irreplaceable. They were presented to the collection by Fred Lake for whom I'm indebted. One of the strange collections within the collection here are archery related dinner plates and other China works by Royal Dalton, which were merchandise under the name of, name of the Greenwood Tree. Obviously, they were manufactured in the 19th century and are very collectible items. And within the collection, there is a perfection with a tea set with cups and saucers and plates. A very rare item which was produced by Royal Dalton. The oil on display immediately in front of us is an oil of the uniform, an early uniform of the Royal Company of Archers, which would be somewhere in the date of about 1750, 1740. And the bow which is holding is an exact a replica of the one earlier of which you have taken which dates it to the bowyer of that period, uh, which has been recorded by Hugh Saw. The oil on the right hand side, that gentleman is in the uniform of the Royal St George's Archers. The drawing on the right hand side is alleged to have been of one of the princes. The royal family always being active in the interest of archery. Our future king um, has always taken an interest in archery. 
and of course his mother, the Queen Elizabeth II, is still patron of the Royal Toxophilite Society. Earlier, you know, at our meeting, going round the gallery, I brought to your attention of the bows which were used by the early wiring of telephone to homes. And this particular bow here demonstrates the bows which were used to shoot arrows over houses. And they were centre shot bows, but they were designed to stretch lines across short distances. They were very effective and saved a lot of industry in trying to get wires to various residences and over trees and obstacles, including possibly going up slopes. Here forward, down to the bottom of the stand, are French bows, most of which are, have been used for shooting either a target or for pop and jay shooting. There are interesting bows here in that um, that bow there, for instance, is what, I, what we call a fluted bow. And the flute again is to give strength to the bow itself. That's this one here, beg your pardon, that one here. You can see the artistry which is in it. And that gives straightness to the bow and, and strength to the bow. It's a remarkable bow because it's got wonderful horn knocks, superb knocks, and it's designed for uh, target shooting. Some bowyers have said that it possibly could have originated not from France, but from Scotland for clout shooting. Clout shooting would be at nine score yards. But it's there on display with the French section because it could have come or used by in Popinjay shooting. The masts would be somewhere in the region of about 120 feet up. And the object and exercise were for the arrows, such as these, to be shot. And they're flat, weighted at the top with wood to knock out the little bird. And when they fall to the ground, they would be counted up. That is popping day shooting. It's still carried out with enthusiasm within Belgium and in some areas of France. And these are popping jay arrows here. Lasers also shoot popping jay arrows. That's a modern one, a fiberglass one, and again it's on the same design. That would be shot sometimes by a junior, a teenager, or by some men shooting a very heavy poundage bow with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a, a heavier arrow. Notice still the horn knocks which have been let. They would be crafted out of, uh, out of a, a popular it's a really lightweight wood. Again, some of these arrows will be fluted to give strength to them because they were using a heavy poundage bow. And notice the woodwork again here, where they use a plane to cut cutting grooves into the arrow. Popping jay bows, uh, wooden ones are no longer made. If they are, they're a rarity. Uh, what happens with popping jay bows, wooden ones, they were manufactured liberally by bowyers in Belgium. They were superseded by uh, Durin, and that is a typical bow, possibly used for popping jay shooting and for tournament shooting. And you will see here that they've, the strings here are of metal. It's steel wire. They were very fast 
and very efficient that obviously people were aware of the steel strings and as a consequence the, uh, it, they, it wasn't popular to shoot them but they were effective before the fiberglass bows were, were produced which are just around the corner here that is a typical fiberglass bow one here which has been used for the purpose of uh, target work as well as within um, clout shooting that is the one which I was looking for that's all fiberglass and that was used for popping jay shooting it's got a wide edge there as you can see to hold the arrow on it's a very skilled practice as we were possibly uh, enthusiastic about clout shooting the, uh, the Belgians are very keen on popping jay shooting there's another example of a fiberglass bow for popping jay shooting they were recurved but the craftsmanship, for instance, this one, is remarkable. Now, Chris Boynton, a modern bowyer, unfortunately he was no longer with us. He's deceased. Unfortunately, he lost his life quite early. But he, designed, he went over to Belgium and was watching the Belgian bow makers in the manufacture of those bows. You can see by the craftsmanship within just the handle, with the work uh, of, of which goes into making them, with the horn at the top and bottom. A lovely piece of work. And uh, Chris, who made this, said, Bill, I shan't be able to shoot it, but I would like it to come to your collection. It's proudly on show, not only as a popping jay bow, but one which was manufactured by a very, a very able and a very competent bowyer in this country. His bows are still very popular. Now, I was very pleased to show you Alice shooting her bow before the painting was done by William Powell Frith. And here, in fact, is a print of the original, which is on display in the Exeter Museum. And it clearly shows Alice shooting. And you will see that she's shooting with a U-bow with uh, a glove, in actual fact, with a shooting glove. And she's also shooting with footed arrows. And uh, she has obviously been taught in the correct manner because her forearm is coming right behind that arrow. The one on the right hand side here is a print of the two sisters here. This is a very romantic uh, print of two young ladies shooting. It's remarkable. But more importantly, what it does show is that it clearly is the shooting glove, the back of the bow, the handle of the bow, which is Valeur, and also her sister. This one here, on the right hand side, is an oil painting, and I'm not quite sure by whom, which shows Robin Hood and his merry men. Friar Tuck, obviously, with a, a nice red nose and a ruddy face. And of course, that is Richard the Lionheart, with his uh, uh, henchman by the side of him. We've just got to thank Derek Rowe for making a, a more than an important contribution towards archery. Now that is possibly controversial, but I think it's a work of art. All that is second-hand ivory, and it shows a workmanship of what she was capable of accomplishing. I so admired it. He said, well, one day I will present it to the Beechingwood Collection that silver broadhead. Notice the inlaid ivory, which is here. Even the veins are ivory. 
including the knock at the end of the arrow, with inlaid work to the knock. It's a superb piece of work. It's on the side presented the presentation arrows, arrow by Derek Rowe, Master Bowman and Fletcher, East Sussex. I'm pleased to say he resides in Bexhill now with Maura, his wife. That one here is a takedown longbow, which is not often found. And this is a carriage longbow by Derek Rowe of Manchester and Bexhill. It's got a sleeve of steel inside the handle. It is designed as a laminate bow and, you know, it's a quality product. These were made by Femora, his wife. She was a very fine archer too both of whom were members of the Royal Toxophilite Society. Derek, in his 60s and 70s, was still a fine archer. Those are three arrows which he made for demonstration purposes for uh, Maura, his wife. I think they, they were made for their anniversary, wedding anniversary. Down on the South East Coast here, in Kent, there's Archery Square and the Georgian houses are built all the way around the square and within the square, in the centre, there was the archery range and the club hut and the club house has still got photographs of archer shooting but it's been given over completely now to tennis courts. That's a tennis, that latest tennis racket. That would be uh, 19th century, early 20th century. So croquet gave way then to tennis and archer clubs. What people don't realise is that this uh, Robin Hood, The Adventures of Robin Hood, the, uh, the success of the film which came out in 1938-39 was so popular because it was in Technicolor which was a new medium within filming gave a high ranking to the adventures of Robin Hood now that film travelled throughout Europe and this is a poster in French and what it does show is a general scene of the of the actual film within that poster and that's Olivia de Havilland as, as Maid Marian looking up at Errol Flynn you can see Errol Flynn shooting and one of the nicest scenes in archery is that when he's attending a tournament in disguise and uh, Prince John is watching the shooting taking place. But the archer actually who's spitting the arrow is an American uh, champion. But that particular poster there is quite remarkable. It shows Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, Basil Rathbone and Claude Rains, all four great actors. But the, the uh, the accoutrements to that particular bow is wonderful, that shooting. He's got all, all the attire which would have been, shall we say, artistically designed for Robin Hood. There's some very, very interesting prints here, which go back into to the 18th century, 1700s. The founder of the Royal British Bowman. It actually sold for £35,000 or £30,000 and it was offered to the Royal Company. It was also offered to the Royal Chox and to the Woodman of Arden, but they all declined it because of its size. 
with no hands in a United States University hall. These here, they have a regal standing. That's uh, the Royal Tops founded in 1781, the Royal Kentish Bowman in 1785, the Royal British Bowman, then the West Kent Archery Society, 1864. That's the Woodman of Arden. That one, that uniform. That is a proper arrow stand made of oak with some lovely shafts in them, quitted shafts. But some of those bows there, one particular bow, was said to be in the ownership of the Reverend uh, Charles John Perry King. If it wasn't, then it was one of, one of his daughters. This person here, uh, who looked very modest, just as a young man, he was Jack Collier. And I had an admiration for Jack that was followed in his record, which he set at Worcester College. And those were his trophies. And uh, he managed to secure that 913, only dropping one arrow, out of 144 arrows. He did a 143, 913. With one of those falcon steel bows, you imagine trying to shoot that, the falcon steel bows, with elementary alloy arrows. They were the tall spined. One thing which I would wish to mention is that the library here is dedicated to the memory of Fred Lake. Fred Lake was the bibliographer of the collection of books which were printed, the Bibliography of Archery, which is a collection of, uh, of, all, the, um, of all the archery books that have been printed since the period from, uh, from Henry VIII. Henry VIII engaged Robert Ascombe to teach Princess Elizabeth, on whom he dedicated and may, may have realised that one day she could possibly be queen. So he gave her an excellent education and brought down um, Roger Ascombe, who was uh, in that capacity as a, as, a, as a principal within the University of, uh, of Cambridge to teach Princess Elizabeth um, not only Latin, but French and Spanish, as well as English. And he was also um, instructing her in, the, uh, in history of the United Kingdom and also for Europe. And uh, he was a very gifted teaching to uh, a very talented Princess Elizabeth. He also introduced her to archery knowing that her father, uh, Henry VIII, was also uh, a very active participant in archery. And uh, uh, Henry VIII commissioned him to write a book on the subject of archery. And he was so delighted with the book he wrote, which is called Toxophilus, which was printed in the 1650s, that um, he gave him a stipend for the rest of his life. Um, it wasn't a, a, a engaged in a fortune, I think it was somewhere in the region of a few guineas per annum, but that was a large sum of money to be awarded, you know, to an intellectual. But Roger Ascombe formed the basis of shooting, of standing, drawing, aiming, holding and loosing. That is the basis of archery. Uh, the method of shooting even today. He is to be admired for his first work on archery, the text on shooting. And uh, he also gave an elementary history of the, of the bow itself. So we owe much to Roger Ascombe for bringing archery into 
the 19th and the 20th centuries and that formed the basis of, of uh, shooting technique throughout the period of the medieval um, Hundred Year War and also throughout the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Yeah. Quite a, quite a modern one, and it's got oh, wow. knocks on as well. Mm. Well, we go out for a cup of tea. And, that would uh, be nice. After you do, ladies first. Yeah.